So anyway, I think it would definitely be worth, if you guys want to do Titan Miles, it'd be worth talking about it because there's some nice gotchas that I think I've worked through. Are, are you talking about a meal? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so what do you mean as, is this like a gotcha? So the caravan data, um, mm -hmm. the order of the factors are uh, no than yes. And so Tidy Models is actually modeling no, uh, no purchase. And so if you use stack, if you use the statistics like the um, positive predictive value or negative predictive value, they're backwards. So if you, so the book doesn't explicitly say, so there's a couple little base R snippets that are doing calculations, but they don't say what they're doing is the positive predictive value. Okay. And so like, I've pretty much lost my mind over that because I'm like, wait, this is positive predictive value. And then when I tried to use the positive predictive value function within tidy models, it was wrong, but the negative predictive value was right. So there's that mess. And so I've mm -hmm. got, I've got code. I got some stuff that I can share with people on, on how to fix that. And then the other notable gotcha is the KNN modeling. So if you do the KNN that you get from the book versus the KNN that you get from Titan models has different answers. And so we had to figure out why. And the, the answer is the KNN that's in the book is using um, the class, I think, yeah, the class package, which handles ties by including all of the ties in the prediction, okay? So if you mm -hmm. specify do k equals three, but there's ties, the k is actually four, and then it will randomly choose people who are tied in terms of distance. So if you run the book code over and over again with different seeds, you'll get different answers. But if you run the KNN in tidy models, you always get the same answer. That is a strange one. It was awful, dude. <laughs> it was just like, why does this not work? Yeah, I, I tend to, um, I'll be 100% honest, I tend to just ignore all that and just go straight with the, um, current version and don't even didn't even think about the um how it was working in the background um it's not it's not uh, necessarily the best behavior in the world to be honest um i'm it's, usually it, rushing my way through it it's rational i mean the the it was like a lot of hours to figure that out well, this is problem a lot with a lot of issues in coding is generally the um generally yep. comes the same problem which is that um what is a different like i'm currently looking at the difference between two i forests um yep. one is radically different from the other but there's not really a rational reason for it even though in theory they're the same um yeah but you know this is this is part of the data science yeah i'm completely with you what what was just making me nuts is like i'm supposed to teach tidy models and if my answers are not matching the book, I'm like, what's wrong with my code? Mm. <laughs> and so, you know, rather than embarrassing myself in front of 50 students by showing the wrong code, I wanted to figure out what was the root of the difference. But yeah, it's, you know, you don't normally take five hours to figure out why a package is giving you a different answer. <laughs> No, but um, to be honest, is the great the biggest problems typically are actually something that's simpler than you think, but it's just something that's hidden from sight. Yeah. yeah um, so, where did we get to last time? Um, uh, four point five, right? You finish up to four point six, isn't it? Okay. No, uh, four point five. If you last time, yeah. Uh, last week 
like if you guys want, I have the notes that John has not updated. I can share the slide side for 4.6. Then if you guys want, then we can just go up. We can just discuss 4.6, then maybe do lab for next week or a discussion for next week. Yeah, I like the sound of that. I love that. Go on. Especially considering you're staying up until the middle of the night. So the least we could do is meet. So we finish up to 4.6 from last week. So the summary of it, that if you go into GLM, there wasn't much. It was just uh, usually use GLM for count data. And so I don't remember it was, uh, they're using a byte share data set where they look into how the number, like how the number of bikers changes according to by month or by hours. Then this whole small section was just talking about how you would want to use, uh, instead of using linear regressions, you might want to use a, a different regression, which is the Poisson regression modeling. So this is the one that in, I think in R we use the GLM one. And this is important. So because usually for regression, if you decided what people do is they just do a log transformation but then if you do a log transformation, there's always a difficulties in interpreting the meaningful statistics. You wouldn't have to explain how the changes in X would be uh, related to the log in Y. So that's the best way to do is just doing this regression model. And so if you do this one, the interpretation is how we can explain how increases in X is associated with changes in Y then you can have a mean variance relationship where the mean is always equal to the variance. And instead of if, if you don't use, if you use a lock, usually you realize you see a lot like negative fitted values, but this would not be a problem if you use this poison regression model. So that's only the small parts of then if you, um, yeah. so I was just looking at the lab because I've not tried the, I have not tried the lab exercises for this book, but theoretically how you use GLM is just, um, you just put, a, this is in LME4, right? I believe, was it in base R? Uh, I think it's in LME4 where you have these GLM functions that you can just fit the family to be like binomial. Then the rest of the coefficients, you can just easily get it like coef from here, whatever predictors that you have, then you, they use it to predict directions. So you can easily get the coef here. Uh, oh, here's the coef, then the summary of everything. So how I usually do is I just do run a GLM analysis, then, then I check for the fit using the performance package. You can, then you should always check for the predict as well. You can use that predict to look at it. But anyone else like familiar with the GLM mod? <laughs> It's wait, what you described is what I do. Yeah. I feel like the lab is you just go through like things here. <laughs> I'm not sure like what they want. I haven't finished whole, the whole lab exercises, but roughly you just run a model, then you run a predict, then you check for the fitness using, like, I check using performance package, then that's all. Uh, I'm not sure about tiny models, like maybe someone else wants to talk about tiny models a bit. Then we can have more time to discuss about the exercises next week.
So I, I have a bunch of tidy model stuff that I'm not prepared, but let me see if I can find the project. Um, just to clarify, well, actually, I say to clarify, um, what is the difference between a LM and a GLM? I can't remember off the top of my head. Oh, I will just uh, linear mix model, I think. Then GLM was just a general. And so, uh, LM has, are you like, LM is just a lead, um, you have to use it for continuous dependent variable, but for GLM, you have to use it for those like Poisson distribution. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. With with the G, you can you can technically you can specify the link, so you can mm. if you want to do Poisson regression, you can do it. If you want to do um, um, all kinds of different distributions. Um, so do you guys want to see tidy models junk or should you want to do it next week? I got one thumbs up. Yeah, yeah I, I use it for my homework, but it's the first time I've used it. So <laughs> code worked, but don't know if I was, you know, doing it as optimally as possible. It's a lot. Um, okay, so let me show you what I've been doing with my spare time, ha ha. Um, okay, so again, my mindset on this is I've got students who, who were shown LM and I, I think shown LM, maybe shown LM and they haven't maybe seen GLM. I think they get, is Wayne on here? Yeah, I, I think that they get taught Okay. Yeah. Students in my program get taught this next semester, but anyway. Um, so what I've done is for the people like me or, or for Mei Ling, actually I guess for everybody, the people who normally are doing um, base R, I'm trying to do a crosswalk. So over here, this column is base R from the book. And then this is how I would do stuff in tidy models. And so I'm, I'm not good with tidy models yet, but I'm, I'm not bad. Um, so differences are like, you have to add on um, the tidy models package. You don't know this trick. This is one of my favorite R things. So like when you start up tidyverse or tidy models, it vomits all kinds of information that you just don't need to see. You so want to be careful with that. <laughs> um, you do. Um, Okay, now you made me go here. So there's another package that our that Hadley at, at our studio has invented called Conflicted. Mm -hmm. And so the first package I load whenever I start up R is Conflicted. And what it does is it watches for if you're using a function that's defined in two packages. So like filter is in, I think base and is also in dplyr. Mm -hmm. So it will not let you use filter until you specify which one you want. Yeah. So, but yeah, August, your point is very well taken. You can end up with all kinds of badness if you're calling a function and it's the wrong version of the function. When I Those, teach, yeah. Uh, when I teach, I make a package called unfriendly, and the unfriendly package includes a, a function called mean. And so it makes students, when they call the mean function, it will say mean things to them if they haven't <laughs> said which mean you're supposed to use. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Um, for those that don't know, this um, if you look down to the third, um, third set of code on the right-hand side, it says skimmer, and then there's two colons, and that's how you specify a function from a particular package. Yep, R right on. So um, skim is one of my favorite functions for doing exploratory work, and if I was a better, I guess maybe I should, I don't know if I should include the library, but yeah. So this says go into the skimmer package and run skim. Um, I don't know why I'm not, now that you say this, I don't know why I just didn't do library skimmer. 
but okay. Um, it's actually a so, good thing to put in there for, because most people don't know what, what it is double colon when they first come across it. So if they are learning to code and you want to teach them about um, uh, yep. issues with cross functionality, then this is the best way to get around it. And it's pretty it's straight there. Right on. So I'll, I will add a note to the code. Um, so explain colon colon. And it, it's also really nice because you know what package you need to add to get it. So what Skimmer does um, is it gives you the same information as doing dim. So you see the number of rows and columns, tells you factors, number of factors, number of numeric variables. Then it gives a, a brief descriptive for the categorical. And then what I love about it is it gives you the numeric and it gives you this silly little pseudo histogram. So in one second, you can see if you've got skewed data, if you have bimodal data, um, obviously it's not that great, but it does let you see if you have bimodal data. So it's good statistics. Then they walk through in the book, um, the pairs function, which I think is just like, okay, um, a snowball, I guess. Um, and so an alternative, is to use ggalley. So this is ggalley is extra um, add-ons to make different ggplots. Um, and so it has the gg pairs, which you can see below, um, trying to get the points so that you can kind of see, took some magic, the wrap thing. I don't really understand it, but I eventually, obviously I got it to work. Um, and so this was to set the size, the details in this plot. And then the combo thing is for showing um, the histogram details. So an alternative to pairs um, is this. Um, they show how you can get the correlation. And then I just did the deep, the deep plier version of take the data set, filter it down to one variable, or sorry, drop one variable and then feed it to the core function. Um, they show the, the, what's this thing called? Is this a series plot? Anybody know? Mm, no, okay. It, it, it's, it's basically just, um, what's it? It's a core plot with a, uh, with a smoother through it, isn't it? So you could, you could classify it as a time series with, yeah. um, with correlation, with scatter points. Yeah. So it's just showing the values in order as in, in, the, in the index order of the, going down the column, it's that order. Um, and so ggplot threw in the points, threw in um, smoother. Um, GAM is just um, general, ad, general additive models. Yep. Can't remember, um, but thank you. And so this is saying just put a, um, I think this is a line. Anyway, put a smoother through the data and then go to the manual and figure out what BS equals CS. Um, it is a spline. It's a, uh, was it a base spline, I believe. I'll buy that. Look I'll look up. Okay. So put a smoother through it. Um, then talk about logistic. And so here's the GLM that Leiming uh, was just showing us. So you specify that the, the link or the family is binomial in the summary. So entity models, you do this differently. You, you, you start out by saying, I want to use some engine, or sorry, you start out by saying, I want to do logistic regression. And then you specify what engine you want to use. Um, so here, logistic, everybody would just use GLM. And then conceptually, you say, OK, I've got some outcome that I want to predict with some predictors in this data set. So what I, what I love about tidy models is this distinction between some analysis engine and what I actually care about. So this, the recipe says, predict this with these things. Then you can take this recipe and some model specification and combine them. So it's beautiful in tidy models is you can swap out this engine 
or you can swap out the engine. So if you want to do some Bayesian thing instead of using a GLM, you can swap out the engine or you can swap out the entire modeling strategy. So to swap out logistic regression from a neural net is just a matter of changing this. And then you use the same basic workflow where you say, take the rest, start out with a workflow. So have an empty plan, add in a recipe saying what you want to model, then add in a model to say how you want to do it, and then um, fit the model. So I got an email. So I posted a question on, um, I don't know if it was on Stack Overflow or if it was on GitHub, but I got an email from Julia Silge, uh, who's like God to me, um, or a, a demigod to me. And she said, don't use um, extract fit parsnip anymore. So I will update this very soon. I think the, the correct way to do this now is just extract fit. Bottom line is you say, um, fit this model, and then you can pull out pieces of it. Um, yeah, fit, fit the workflow, fit the workflow on this, this particular data set and pull out the results. So again, there's a new verb, which I think they just is just extract fit. But this verb returns the same inform returns the fit object, just like this does. So this is saying, show me the fit, and then you can do the summary on the fit. Now, what I think, if I use extract fit instead of extract fit parsnip, then the summary would just be summary of this, and I can drop this crazy dollar sign fit thing. I have a question about this workflow. Um, so I was just looking at, at emails, you know, the guide for the link that we have at the top pinned for this um, Slack channel. And I did not use it, the recipe. I just put all that in fit. And I can see why breaking it up into separate steps would, you know what I mean, a lot more flexibility depending on what part you wanted to change. Um, is this like the more updated way to do it or the more complete way? Um, I basically just use like, let me look at this real quick, the specifications um, and then LR spec, fit, fit, fit the model, and then I just call tidy on it because you know, I just wanted to see the model easily. So yeah. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about that. So, so this was the only way to do this for a while, um, or this the workflow for a while. I, I think it's within the last six months, the way that you describe where you directly call fit without breaking it up in all the steps. So the way you described, I believe is newer. This way has the, has the big, in my opinion, has the big advantage of it's a lot clearer if you can stand doing all the typing, okay? Obviously, this is a hell of a lot, sorry, a heck of a lot to type instead of this, but for my money, this is really transparent. And again, for, I'm, for teaching novices, if I can convince them it's worth doing the copy and paste or doing the typing, it's, it'll save them headaches. It's I also really them. like, Sorry, Raymond. Uh, it, it's worth adding that the main reason why tidy models is kind of invented is because um, in Python, they, uh, there is SK Learn. And the whole point of SK Learn is to make these systems more um, uniform and explicit so that they can be used easily in uh, modeling pipelines. And mm -hmm. so the whole approach here is to be able to add each building block together to create a, a coherent system, whereas Currently, each package is almost standalone with different um, different uh, names for, different, for the same functions. If they do relate, or alternatively, um, different or alternatively functions that don't fit inside the same systems, um, and then you have to go to another package in order to get uh, the missing function. So the whole point is to standardize everything and bring it all together into a coherent workflow that can be used um, in a systematic way. Uh, across different packages. Yep. 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 That matches 
that's exactly how I'm thinking about this stuff. The if if you haven't done tidy models yet, this is huge. So the recipe the the recipe package you can start out with something simple like this, um, but then you can add on other pieces of the recipe. So th this is only working off of a single data set, but in the next chapter, we're going to get to resampling. So start out with the data set, pull out a chunk, and build a model on that chunk. What's lovely with recipes is you can add in other steps to do things like, OK, do um, principal components analysis. OK? And so you can say, take these variables, do principal components, but only do it on the subsample that you've um, pulled out of the big data set. And so the recipe like, um, what's the right way to put this? Encapsulates or holds together all of the steps that you wanna do on this sample. Here, this sample is the entire data set, but with, with the tidy models framework, you can make this recipe really complicated. And I, I love that. Okay. So a little bit of typing or a lot of typing. Um, um, this was a pain to figure out. Um, so with, to get the coefficients in base, you just do coefficients. As Laura mentioned, you can take the, the model fit and tidy it up, select the data. And then I was using D frame because I wanted it to be um, exactly the same as this. So the D frame just basically says strip off the data frame and turn it into a vector. Um, there's another, there's a function in dplyr, which I'm not, is it pull or yank or something like that, which will pull, anybody know, is it pull? Yes, pull, I write the yank function a lot <laughs> So, so, so you, you can in theory do pull to pull out um, just the estimates, which is the coefficients. But if you do that, you lose the terms. And so, as in, it's just, you get a bunch of numbers, but you don't have the labels. And so this was the, the voodoo that I figured out where you select the description and the number and then deframe them and it turns into this. Um, so here's summary versus tidy. Um, trying to remember the advantages of tidy. Um, oh, a big one is these names are consistent versus this. So which what August was commenting on how each, each independent model in base R is independent. And so you don't know if the p-value column is going to be called PRZ or whatever, um, and z-value. Um, so the tidy version makes these consistent. So that later on, if you want to stack different modeling techniques and compare them, it's easy. Um, I hate when people give me code like this. It's like what the uh, expletive is column four versus within the tidy models you specify. I want the term and column four is the p-value. Um, then it talks about the predictions. So these are pretty darn, this pretty much the same. Again, take the workflow, the dollar sign fit thing, I think will go away if I, when I update the code, um, but you take the results from the workflow, pull out the model fit, and then feed that into, um, you know, predict and it will predict. Um, contrast, contrast, whatever. Um, so then this was, again, things that make me crazy. Have fun getting this right in when base R. Should this be less than or greater than? Um, as opposed to in tidy models, you can just say, take the data, augment it, which means adds on, add on the predictions, and then you can use the confusion matrix function. Um, I'm, I'm in biostat, and so I spend a lot of time with epidemiologists. They, they, will, they will go crazy when they see this. So in epidemiology, you always have yes, yes in the upper left corner. Um, so <laughs> how to make an epidemiologist actually explode, give them a table where it's been pivoted. Uh -huh. um, 
So, and then they go through, this is, um, they manually calculate accuracy. Again, what is this? Um, and then here in tidy models, accuracy, I think is in yardstick. So it's part of the tidy models framework in the yardstick package is accuracy and it gives you a well-labeled accuracy. Um, and supermarket, they make the train and test data set um, this is just me doing it. Deplier, um, same junk. They fit a GLM. Um, they get the probabilities, same thing. Um, take the workflow and fit it on this new data set, get the results, do the predictions. Um, same story again, if I remember. Yeah, same story again. Um, this was fun. So here they they fit a a reduced model with less predictors, and they do it as just ignore what you previously did. So then this is showing like some of the niceties within um, within tidy models. You can say take what you did before, but now change the recipe. Where the recipe I want to take the old recipe and add in a step which will drop these three variables. I'm not entirely convinced this is really readable, but it does tie together that you're taking what you did before and modifying it. Um, so you end up with um, a modified workflow. If and you then here, to uh, sorry, if you wanted to make it Please. readable, I know this isn't ideal, um, but what you could do is that uh, you can either break out the, um, you can break out the list or uh, uh, the concatenation and then just press enter, 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 and then you can see that there's three lines added onto it, or you just do step, step remove four times. Yes. I'm, that's just, um, I think, makes it easier for someone else to come back to read the code. Thank you. I'm going to... Okay, so so add multiple step removes. Okay, I like that. Sorry, I I've been doing the the data data camp as a like a tidy models like uh, lesson, and one of the things that I came across I'm not sure if you're familiar with it is custom metrics, which it allows you to, to just basically create a list of the different like fit statistics that you're looking at, accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, um, and just basically plug in your, your, um, your results that you've gotten from your fitted model and you will get a, a tibble with the actual output for those like specific fit statistics. So it's pretty cool that you can sort of like customize it. So in the chat, I put a list of the, like the actual statistics that they, that they can, that you can get from the custom metrics function, but I, I think it's kind of cool. So just wanted to throw that out there. All right, I will bug you and we will add this in to my code. Got it. So I see like accuracy. So in, in what Wayne put in the chat, you can do custom ac custom metrics for accuracy. Um, and you can see that down below, I'm doing that one just by itself. Cool. So that's huh. the last thing that I just pasted there was just like how you would call call the function and then it will return what you what you um, what you specified in the custom metrics section. So cool. I need to steal that. Cool, thank you, August. So metric set. All right. Um, 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 um. Okay, so change the model, um, refit it, and then again, augment is great because it will take the original data set and add on um, your predictions. So predicted class and predicted probabilities. So you get the data set 
Um, that makes sense to me anyway with every predictor and then the prediction. And then you can feed that. So this is take the workflow, take that workflow, apply it to this new data set and augment it. So you end up with the predictions and then you can run can, um, the, the confusion matrix, the two by two matrix on that data. Um, same stuff. And again, rather than this, which I think is horrible um, for novices to understand, you just call accuracy and it gives you the accuracy. So that's from Yardstick. Um, then predictions, you can specify, I want predictions on a couple of people. So you specify the details. Say you want the responses and it gives you the predicted probability. Um, same basic junk. Um, then it gets, they talk about discriminated analysis. Um, so you use LDA or in tidy models, you say, I want to do discriminant, linear discriminant analysis. So use this function. Then you add in details, say, I want to do classification, set the engine. So again, this is like the abstraction of, I want to do this kind of analysis, specify a recipe, add them together, fit them, extract the model fit, and you get the same stuff. This one was a serious pain to figure out. So you can just say, I've got this thing, this model that I fit in base R and plot it, and you get the default plot. Trying to figure that out in tidy models was just insane. So you get the fit, and if you run plot on it, it just doesn't work because it says it can't find, I think it was like y equals dot x, okay? It couldn't find the name of the predictor and the name of the outcome. So within the workflow, um, yeah, you can actually see it here. Inside of the workflow, it's the y's, your outcome variable gets changed to dot dot y, and the predictors gets changed to dot x. Okay, so like in the internals, which is fine, but when I tried to run plot on it, it couldn't figure out what dot dot y was. Uh, that might have made sense. Anyway, so you can't just run plot on the fit model. There's in, inside of Parsnip, which is part of tidy models, you can repair the call, which in English says take the abstraction and convert it back to the actual names. So it will rename dot dot y to be direction, which was the outcome. And you specify this is the data set to run on it, to run it on, um, extract fit, fit engine, which is like reasonably new in Titan models, and it works. So in theory, any of the default plot methods you can use in Titan models by using this bit of magic. Um, then predictions, predictions, it's pretty straightforward. Here you augment again to add the predictions onto the data set and then do the confusion matrix, do the accuracy. Um, you can specify custom thresholds for how high does the predicted probability have to be before it's in some group. So by default, it's at 0.5. And this is just, um, make the predictions and then take the people who are in the, the high group, take the number of people who are in the low group to get the same thing. Um, same magic again, augment, um, pull out a variable. Look at, um, then pretty much exactly the same workflow with QDA. Here it is in base, here it is in tidy models. Notice the big difference here is you have used, you've abstracted away what you're doing. In this case, I'm doing quadratic discriminant analysis. So that changes and the rest of this is just the same. Same stuff works, same stuff works. Um, <laughs> okay, naive Bayes, oh my goodness. Um, so the book uses E1071, which I think was like some class number some time ago. So they use this library 
that is not available within tidy models. So I'm going to do naive Bayes using the naive Bayes package instead of that one. Um, so here's the abstraction. Here's the recipe of what I want to predict. The rest of it's just the same. Um, but you get different outcome, different output down here because it's using um, a different package. The numbers match though. Um, what did I say in here? Okay, so this I will. This is what Julia wrote to me. The fix on this. So I think when I change this from extract fit to ab. Sorry, when I go from extract fit parsnip to simply abstract fit, it should fix itself. So I'll share this eventually. And the and the, the, the there's a bunch of warnings, and this just turns them off. And August, your point earlier about it's really dangerous to turn off warnings. Things can go wrong. Um, uh huh. Um, so get the confusion matrix, get the accuracy, um, do the predictions. So predict on the fit, predict on the fit. It's pretty much exactly the same thing. Okay. <laughs> so then this is what I was mumbling about at the beginning. K nearest neighbors, you get different results on everything except for K equals one. Okay, and this is just purely a coincidence. So the code from the book, the code from tidy models, this is using class, this is using the KKNN package. You get different, you get the same answers here because there's no ties. There's when you do K equals one, there are no, there's never a case where the, the closest, <laughs> there is always a closest point for the K equals one. There's not two points that are equidistant. Um, so abstraction, I wanna do K nearest neighbors. I want the closest neighbor, use this package, same predictors, same recipe, same fit and extract. Um, exactly the same answers. The book should have labeled this as accuracy. It's accuracy. In my opinion, they should have labeled it. Um, here's the same thing for k equals three. Same thing for k equals three. Um, my warning in the Stack Overflow post about why is this? Why doesn't this match this? Again, the short answer is there's ties. Um, caravan. Okay, caravan. The outcome is a factor. So that, as this says. Um, the outcome is a factor. Tidy models calls the event the first level. So it is actually the event or the thing you are predicting in this case um, is no. There's two strategies I could come up with. I like the first one better, which is before you do your modeling, change the order of the factors. So this says make no the last in the list of factor orders which in other words, puts yes first. Um, once you do this, then the usual epi statistics like positive predictive value, negative predictive value work as they should. Because again, epidemiologists want the yes first, the, the outcome of interest first. Another option is you, if you leave the data in its original format, so no is the first category, you can say, hey, yardstick, when you're calculating accuracy, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, sensitivity, specificity, the outcome is the second one. So if you've ever messed around with, eh, you know, SAFs, this is kind of like playing with descending. Um, anyway, so this is a, just another way of saying, I want to be predicting the second level, which is yes. Once that's in place, um, you can get the dimensions of the table. You can get the, the percentage, yes, no. Um, if you don't know the janitor package, it's awesome. Janitor has a function called table spelled like that. Um, and it gives you nice frequency tables. So janitor will go through and fix if you've got names that are 
if you're pulling in data from SAS or SPSS and the names are crazy or from, from whatever, Janitor will has functions that will fix the variable names. And it also has the phenomenal table package, which gives you stuff like this. So this gives you a basic frequency table. And then there's adorn verbs. So you can adorn details. So here I'm, I'm saying adorn with rounding. And so that makes us four digits. Um, this madness of standardizing, it, you just do it inside of tidy models or just you do it inside of recipes. Um, so here they're making training and test. Here I'm making training and test. So splitting the data into two components, one to build a model on, another to evaluate on. Um, here they're doing the k-nearest neighbors. Again, remember this is the thing which will find too many people um, and then randomly choose when there's ties. So you do need to set a seed if you're gonna use this one. If you're using tidy models, you use KKNN, which just chooses, if you say K, if um, K is three, it's just gonna take the three closest neighbors in whatever order the data was in, for better or for worse. So here do K nearest neighbors, get the three, oh, sorry, get the one closest neighbor. Then here in the recipe says, predict this with everything. And then this is just beautiful. So rather than wherever it went, so instead of doing this, um, you can just say, normalize the data, do it on all of the numeric predictors. So if abstraction, what you wanna do, glue them together, extract the model fit, um, augment a data set with, um, run the model on the test data. Um, I hope that was English. So up here, I was building this um, on the training data set. I was specifying the model on the training data set. I'm gonna evaluate it on the test data set get the confidence so you can get the confusion matrix with this this um, piece of madness um, that's actually ppv the positive predictive value so you can call the ppv function on this to get the numbers the ac they do an error rate one minus accuracy so i guess it's this is sorry this was the PPV, which I do here. You can read it. Um, that was K equals one. This is K equals three. Um, pretty much the same magic. Uh, K equals five, pretty much the same magic. Then they do a logistic fit. Um, don't you love it when there's a warning that the authors don't mention? Um, Again, it's the same design. Choose what statistic you wanna do, choose the recipe, glue them together, pull out the fit, fit the predictions, same stuff, same stuff, same stuff. Um, here, I am putting in a different cut point for just how high the probability has to be before you go with to predict a purchase. Um, famous last words, I think that's okay. Um, for the, the Poisson, they start out with describing it. I use glimpse just to show another quick and easy way to look at a data set. Exactly the same model workflow. Um, you specify it's gonna be linear regression. The engine is this, here's my predictors, glue it all together, get some results. Um, this I haven't figured out. Um, Nobody in Stack Overflow could figure it out in 48 hours, which is a really bad sign. Um, I did send a note to the, the folks in, I sent folks, I asked if anybody knows how to do this. So anyway, here they're changing the contrasts so that, uh, I don't remember, do they average out to be zero or something? I uh, can't remember. So they change the contrasts. Um, ask me next week. I'll have that figured out by then. Um, the changing the trying to change the contrasts. So here this is one to twenty-three. Here this is zero. 
through 23. And it's not exactly right is the bottom line. So same basic idea, but in theory here, there's I'm doing so here to try and change the contrast, there's step dummy, which does dummy coding. And I say, I want one hot. So that means I want every level included by like in regular old modeling with the categorical variable, you just drop one level. This says, leave that in, leave it in, in there. So here you'll, you see, you get the, every level is representative and that comes from this. But what I have figured out is then how do I get the dummy coding to pay attention to this contrast? Hopefully I'll have an answer like in a week on how to do that. Um, then stuff for interpretation, I do the plot for the months. Um, I do fit a Poisson and actually I'm out of time and I'm kind of fried. So if this is useful, I can pick it up again next week. That was really good, Raymond. Really like that. Um, can cool. you? Uh, is it possible to share this? Um, uh huh. Um, I'm in a weird spot because I do biomedical research, and so I don't want to have any public-facing stuff until someone mm -hmm. else has read my code. So Wayne, hi Wayne, um, who I work with, um, I will pass my code. He will look at it and make sure that I didn't accidentally paste in anybody's HIV status or cancer status. Uh -huh. That's my world. Um, and then after he's confirmed, I didn't put anybody's medical records in here. I will get it available. Um, so I asked, I've done chapter three and I've done chapter four. So short answer is, uh-huh. Um, probably be a couple of days before Wayne can get to it. Yeah, no worries. Um, it, it, can you quickly go back up to your contrast issue? Yeah. <laughs> you could figure this out for me. So um, it, it, what, what you potentially can do is pull out the contrast in the recipe. Can you? So, so I, I tried. So I went through the old. So I looked in the documentation for recipes on, and like, how do I specify a contrast for a variable? And all I could find is how to set it generally. So if you mm. don't want to, if you want to use a different kind of contrast for every variable, you can do that in like version 1.1. So like three versions ago, there was a note in the package documentation saying, um, our, the contrast statements aren't working in the, in the recipe, <laughs> okay? So it's mm -hmm. like, they know that their code wasn't working. So rather than fixing it, they just removed contrast entirely from the step. Right, okay. So in theory, step dummy probably in six or nine months will work, but I can't figure it out for now. And I've got to be on another call. Sorry guys, um, it's nice to see you. And I look forward to seeing you in a week. Okay, thanks very much guys. Um, Really appreciate that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.